the eighth meeting of the Board of Supervisors. If we could begin with a roll call, please. Supervisor Leopold. Here. Coonerty. Here. Caput. Here. McPherson. Here. Chair Friend. Here. If you could please join us in a brief moment of silence in the Pledge of Allegiance. Mr. Palacio, so are there any changes to today's agenda? Uh, yes, and what may be a first, we have no corrections or additions to the agenda today. Yeah, right before your performance evaluation was done, <laughs> I noticed. Uh, very, very suspect, <laughs> let the record reflect. All right, we'll now move on to the consent agenda. Uh, we'll begin with Supervisor Caput. There's an opportunity for you to either pull items or briefly comment on items on consent. Uh, are there any items you'd like to comment on? I'm okay. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. Good morning, Supervisor McPherson. Uh, good morning, Supervisor Coonerty. Uh, just real briefly on item number 22, uh, I'm really excited to have another downtown outreach worker um, to do uh, important outreach downtown and to give us uh, full week coverage. Thank you. Good morning, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, good morning, Chair. Just a couple items I'd like to comment on. Uh, on item number 17, which is the 2017 quarter four uh, whole person cares uh, port, or whole person cares report. Uh, and the summer, annual summary report, um, you know, it's, it's amazing how quickly the time goes on these projects. And I really appreciate the work that is going on. I hope that it's shared with our other jurisdictional partners uh, so they can see the progress that we're making. And I just want to encourage the staff to, uh, uh, that this is a critical program and to keep on working hard to make sure that we maximize its utility. Um, on item number 19 and number uh, 23, I want to uh, recognize our, our Water Resources Department. I see uh, John Ricker here, but both these are uh, important agreements to look at our, um, our groundwater basins, and I appreciate the work that our staff does in order to help address this pressing uh, issue here in Santa Cruz County. Uh, uh, I really appreciate it, and that's it. Thank you. I'll also briefly comment on item 17, just to say for the whole person care uh, project, it's really useful to have the data as opposed to a lot of the information that uh, uh, people do share out in the community. This is actually useful just to see uh, the actual breakdown of information associated with that. I also like to, on item 29, I support the principal planner for the planning department. I think it's really important with our work that we're doing within the housing section right now to have uh, that addition. Now we'll open it up to the community. This is a member, this is an opportunity for members of the community to comment on items on the consent agenda. If anybody would like to address us on the consent agenda, please feel free to step forward. The consent agenda is items number six through 42. Would anybody like to address us on the consent agenda? Okay, seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board. Oh, uh, I will move approval of the consent agenda. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor Leopold, a second from Supervisor Coonerty. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. <laughs> we'll now move on to oral communications. This is an opportunity for members of the community to address us on items that are not on today's agenda, but within the purview of the Board of Supervisors. You'll have three minutes. Good morning and welcome. Good morning, Supervisor. Kent Washburn, member of your Housing Advisory Commission. I cycle through here periodically to remind you that every single day, households in Santa Cruz County are falling out of uh, uh, safe housing because uh, we have not done our job as commissioners and as leaders of the community to, uh, to take the political debate where it must go in order for us to supply even a fraction of that need. And I want to urge you as, as gracefully but as firmly as I can to, uh, to give us on the commission more work to do. Uh, we'll try to do it and, uh, and let's advance this down the, uh, uh, down the field toward the goal line. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your work on the commission and the recent hearing that you held. Good morning and welcome. <clears throat> uh, good morning. 
Uh, good morning, Chair Friend and members of the board. My name is Jennifer Herrera. I am the Director of Nursing over at HSA Public Health. Um, and I just, on behalf of HSA, our Director Jane Nguyen, um, our Assistant Director Mimi Hall, and Health Officer Dr. Arnie Left, I'd like to thank the board for recognizing Nurses Week 2018, May 6th through 12th. Uh, this year's theme is Nurses Inspire, Innovate, and Influence. Here in Santa Cruz County, our nurses truly inspire, innovate, and positively influence the wellness of our residents. At HSA, we have nurses who inspire their patients by promoting healthy behaviors and family bonding. We have nurses whose innovation helped mitigate disease outbreaks, such as hepatitis A. We have nurses who provide case management to positively influence the lives of people living with chronic illnesses. The impact of our work can be felt on many levels. For instance, we have nurses who provide outstanding direct patient care in clinics. And as you know, our agency director, Jang, is a nurse whose strong leadership has guided our agency to meet the health-related needs of the community. But HSA holds just a snapshot of the amazing capabilities of nurses. Countywide, the inspiration, innovation, and influence of nurses add to the excellent standard of care deserving of every resident in Santa Cruz County. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your work protecting the most vulnerable in our community. My mom is a nurse, so I have a special place for them in my heart. Appreciate your work. Is there anybody else that would like to address us during oral communications? This is your opportunity to address us during oral communications. Yes. Okay, you're fast today. Good morning, Ms. Garrett. Welcome back. Hello. Um, on, um, uh, let's see, this 4G, 5G wireless microwave technology is really proliferating. And 5G, we hear about how wonderful it is. Well, here's some uh, facts you don't hear too much about. 5G and the Internet of Things will cause even greater biological harm than we're already experiencing. Um, some have dubbed plans for a new network of extremely high millimeter wave, uh, small antennas as smart meters on the steroids. There is no doubt that the telecom industry's plans for 5G deployment on top of the existing 4G towers, which are right near me on Freedom Boulevard, I understand, thanks to your leadership, Zach Friend, I, 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 it's very damaging, um, uh, represent the single biggest threat to our safety, health, privacy, and cybersecurity since smart grid deployment began. More details can be found at whatis5g.info. Millimeter waves are utilized by the U.S. Army in crowd dispersal guns and weapons called active denial system. 5G applications will require unlocking of new spectrum bands in higher frequency ranges above 6 gigahertz to 100 gigahertz and beyond, utilizing submillimeter and millimeter waves to allow extra high rates of data to be transmitted. Most people are unaware that these waves are cycling several billion times per second. 75 gigahertz is in fact 75, I think that's billion cycles per second, stated Dr. Deborah Davis about these frequency rapidly penetrating the skin. On tonight's Watsonville agenda, and you represent a lot of the Watsonville area, Supervisor Caput, is under unfinished business is a change of their wireless ordinance to allow um, the telecom industry without notification or hearing to put their radiation devices in the public right of way on utility poles and light standards throughout the city. There's virtually been no discussion or public awareness. This needs to be halted. They need to reconsider it. And it means you'll have this right outside bedroom windows everywhere. This is a good, if I were going door to door in elections, I'd say I'm trying to protect the community. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. This is not healthy, thank you. Thank you, is there anybody else like to address us during oral communications? 
All right, seeing none, we'll close oral communications and we'll begin the regular agenda, which is item 43. Uh, item 43 is a public hearing to consider resolution confirming proposed FY 2018-19 benefit assessment rate and service charge reports for county service areas number 53, 53N, and 53S for mosquito abatement and disease control as outlined in the memo of the Agricultural Commissioner. We have the board memo, the assessment rates, and the resolution. Good morning, Mr. Bining. Good morning. Morning, Chairman, friend, supervisors, and staff, members of the public. I am Paul Binding, and I manage the Mosquito Abatement Vector Control Division of the Agricultural Commissioner called County Service Area 53. On April 10th, your board set today as a public hearing for the annual confirmation of the three benefit assessment rate reports that provide operational funding for CSA 53. These rates have previously been approved by your board. One remains the same as in 2017-18 and the other two have been increased by the consumer price increase as approved in previous elections. We recommend that your board, um, I'm sorry, these rates have been posted in local newspapers and the rate reports made available to the public at the clerk of the board and on the mosquito abatement website prior to today's hearing. If approved, the rate reports will be forwarded to the auditor controller by August 10th to be included in the 2018-19 property tax assessment roll. We recommend that your board open the public hearing, hear any objections or protests to the proposed three assessment rate reports for CSA 53, which are the North and South County Mosquito and Disease Control Assessments and the original Mosquito Abatement Vector Control Assessment. Then please close the public hearing and adopt the resolution confirming the benefit assessment rate reports for CSA 53 for fiscal year 2018-19. We at the Agricultural Commissioner thank you for your ongoing support and welcome you, staff, and the public to our open house to be held sometime in the fall to showcase the improvements you authorized to 640 Capitola Road. Thank you again. Thank you, Mr. Bonney. Are there questions from board members before we open up the public hearing? We will now open up the public hearing. This is an uh, opportunity for members of the community to address us on the assessment rates associated with CSA's number 53, 53N, and 53S for mosquito abatement and disease control. Good morning. Good morning. Could you, I'd uh, like you to state publicly what the assessment rate is, and I'd like details of your mosquito abatement program, uh, what you're using, because pesticides and herbicides often uh, target the unspecified insect and affect the entire uh, environment as is described so well in Rachel Carson's famous 1962 book, Silent Spring, where DDT was sprayed to kill mosquitoes and insects, but it ended up killing the birds and all kinds of creatures. That's why she called the book Silent Spring. The birds were not singing. So I would, I'm very leery of pesticides. I myself was tested for DDT as a nursing mother in 1969. And all us nursing mothers had DDT in our breast milk, a carcinogen. So I'm very interested in what are ecological, um, non-toxic methods of how you're controlling mosquitoes, what you're doing specifically. So I will listen for a response to that. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to address this in the public hearing? Okay, we'll close the public hearing. Just in regards to the rates, uh, there's only two attachments to this item and one of them is lists all the rates. Uh, it would take quite some time to read through them all, but you can see the attachment, but there are no rate changes uh, on CSA 53. Just to give you an idea, it's $11.59 for a single uh, family home. Uh, Mr. Binding, if you would like to very briefly address just uh, the general issue, which does come up repeatedly about um, the methods by which you employ. Yes, uh, on our website there is um, a, a description of the integrated vector management um, uh, uh, process and, and the, uh, the, uh, the way we control mosquitoes and rodents and uh, yellow jackets and ticks. And, uh, it, it, also the annual report gives a more detailed discu discussion of our, uh, our services and uh, the, uh, the benefits to the public. Thank you. I mean, today we're just considering the rates. Is there, uh, Supervisor Leopold? Uh, th thank you, Chair. Um, 
You know, the uh, CDC recently came out with a report just a couple weeks ago saying that the number of Americans sickened by mosquitoes, ticks, and fleas has tripled from uh, 2004 to 2016, and that 80 percent of the vector control organizations didn't have enough money to stop this, these fast-spreading diseases. So to me, this is a model that works, and I think you guys should wear capes when you do your work. Uh, because you're really providing an incredibly important service uh, about preventing the spread of, of disease in Santa Cruz County. Um, the, uh, I would uh, move the recommended actions and thank uh, the staff for their ongoing work. We have, is there a second? All right, we have a motion from Supervisor Leopold and a second from Supervisor Caput. Are there any additional comments or questions from board members? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. Thank you both thank you. for your work. You. We'll move on to Item 44, which is as the Board of Directors of the Davenport County Sanitation District, a public hearing on proposed ordinance amending district code establishing the 2018-2019 water and sewer service charges and take related actions as outlined in the memo of the interim district engineer. We have the board memo, the ordinance number 87 with the strikeout and underline, the, uh, the ordinance with the clean copy, the ordinance for sewer for the strikeout underline, the ordinance for sewer and the clean copy. The first two ordinances were on water rates. We have the service charge reports and the notice of public hearing. And good morning and welcome. Good morning, Chairman Friend and members of the board. I'm Kent Edler with the Department of Public Works and the Devonport County Sanitation District. On March 13th, your board set today as the date, and, uh, date for the public hearing to consider the attached ordinances regarding water and sewer rates for the Devonport County Sanitation District. The service charges will become effective as of July 1st, 2018. The service charge increases are at or below the Bay Area Consumer Price Index of 2.9%. Water service charges are being proposed to increase by 2.6 overall with a 2.9% individual maximum. Sewer service charges are being proposed with a 2% overall increase with a 2.9% individual maximum. We are recommending that your board open the public hearing, consider objections or protests, and upon its conclusion, adopt ordinance, adopt in concept ordinances 87 and 88, establishing water and sewer service charges for fiscal year 2018-2019. Direct the clerk of the board to place the attached ordinances on the next available agenda for final adoption. Set Tuesday, June 12, 2018 at 9, 9 a.m. or thereafter as the date and time for, the, for a public hearing on the serv service charge reports. And direct the clerk of the board to publish the notice of public hearing once a week for two weeks prior to the hearing in a newspaper of general circulation. Thank you. Are there any questions from board members on this item? No questions. I just want to... Uh, no one likes rates going up, but uh, Kent and his team have been really amazing at trying to serve this community in every way possible and keep the rates as reasonable as possible. And so I just want to thank you for your work in, in, on both the water and sewer. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Coonerty. We'll now open up the public hearing. Is there anybody from the community that would like to address us specifically regarding the rates of the Davenport County Sanitation District? Just a comment that if you had evening meetings, more people could participate. At 9 a.m., most people, except for old retired teachers like me, are unable to come and participate. So you have a public hearing, and the public is precluded, most of them, from being here. The cities in this county all have evening meetings. I think you need to do the same so that you can actually hear from more members of the public in person. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Is there anybody else that would like to address us on the public uh, hearing regarding the Davenport County Sanitation District rates? Uh, seeing none, we will close the public hearing and bring it back to the board for action. Move approval. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor Coonerty and a second from Supervisor Leopold for the recommended actions. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. We'll now move on to the next item, which is item 45, which is the Board of Directors of the Freedom County Sanitation District, a public hearing on proposed ordinance amending district code establishing the 2018-2019 sewer service charges and take related actions. As outlined in the memo of the interim district engineer, we have the board memo, the notice of public hearing, the ordinance with the strikeout and clean copy, and the electronic charge reports. Mr. Edler, welcome back. Good morning. So on March 13th, your board set today as the date and is the date for the public hearing to consider the attached ordinance establishing changes to the sewer service charges for the Freedom County Sanitation District. These charges will become effective as of July 1st, 2018. The proposed sewer service charges are being proposed with an overall 6.6% increase, which is higher than the Bay Area Consumer Price Index of 2.9%. 
This is attributed to higher uh, treatment costs that the district pays to the city of Watsonville's treatment plant, increased contribution to the capital improvement program, and additional collection expenses. We are recommending that your board open the public hearing, consider objections or protests, and upon its conclusion, adopt in concept ordinance F23, establishing sewer service charges for fiscal year 2018-2019. Direct the clerk of the board to place the attached ordinance on the next available agenda for final adoption. Set Tuesday, June 12, 2018 at 9 a.m. or thereafter as the date and time for a public hearing on the, service, on the service charge reports. And direct the clerk of the board to publish the notice of public hearing once a week for two weeks prior to the hearing in the newspaper of general circulation. Thank you. Are there any questions from board members? All right, seeing none, we'll now open the public hearing. Is there anybody else that would like to address us on the Freedom County Sanitation District rates? Seeing none, we will close the public hearing. I'll make a similar comment to what Supervisor Coonerty said. Uh, you've done outstanding work, especially in receiving recent grant funding for the disadvantaged community that is served under the Freedom County Sanitation District, and I appreciate all the work that you've done in that area. Is there a motion on this item? So move the recommended actions. Yes. We have a motion from Supervisor Leopold, a second from Supervisor McPherson. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. Thank you for your work. And I move on to item 46, which is to consider a report and presentation on the accessory dwelling unit ADU program, including public guidance documents and web tools available to the public, as outlined in the memo of the planning director. We have the agenda item board memo, the ADU basics guide, the ADU design book, the ADU financing guide, and the accessory dwelling units planning department web link. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. This morning we're happy to be here to show your board the results of some work that the planning department did along with a consulting team to come up with a program that supports and encourages the construction of accessory dwelling units. There's an outreach component that we'll speak about today. It's um, part of a bigger program that includes, excuse me, um, dedicated staff to process accessory dwelling unit permits. Um, we went through two rounds of changes to the regulations over the last two years to make those more simple and um, easier to build an ADU. Um, so a lot of components of this program and this is the last piece to be put in place. With me is Sarah Noisy, um, previously of the planning department. She's now at the city of Santa Cruz and came back today to visit to be part of showing you um, something that she was a very important part of creating. So um, I'm glad that she's here and also thank you to Julie Conway at the planning department in the housing section because she also contributed quite a bit. Our goal with this program is to reach the uh, property owners who are interested in building ADUs but haven't been able to find their way over the finish line. We um, did quite a bit of research to figure out what the barriers are to building ADUs and to target our work to those particular barriers. We um, interviewed uh, lots of people in the industry and importantly, we did a community survey and we spoke with people who came to the counter and investigated building ADU but weren't able to proceed. So we hope that we've found the places where we can have a program that's the very most useful. There are three guidance documents that are part of the outreach program. They were devised to be um, mostly used online and as tear sheets for people to print as needed, but we also will provide them in hard copy to people who, who need that. The first is the ADU basics guide. Bear with me for just a moment. One thing you'll notice is that um, the URL of the website is here and uh, we're launching that today. Jason Hoppen is going to help us do outreach and publicize it. We have a pretty robust website now where people can do a lot of research on their own and prepare themselves to go through the permit process. Um, we begin with an eligibility flow chart and that allows people to um, ask themselves some questions about their property and walk through the permit process, actually walk through the process from the start where you're collecting information, then coming into the planning department and um, people are able to see what is um, able to be done on their property. Um, it begins with um, finding out whether your property is eligible for an ADU and it delivers at the end information about the maximum size ADU that you can build. Uh, 
it gives you the, um, the, the different sizes, and you can actually access this from the website. This is the homepage for ADUs, and um, one of the options is the GIS tool. When you enter the GIS tool, if you have your property address or parcel number, you include that, and what it returns is um, the maximum size ADU you can build, and it also tells you all the special districts that your property is located within. The special districts are important because those fees are an important part of how much it will ultimately cost you to produce that ADU, and um, they vary very much depending on where you're located in the, in the county. It includes a design guide that is designed to um, visually illustrate the site standards for all the different circumstances in which one might want to build an ADU and for the different styles of ADUs. This one, this example is for a conversion ADU and conversions where um, if a property owner can find space either in an existing accessory structure such as a garage or in their home, that's the very most cost effective way to develop a housing unit. So here's an example of um, how we show conversion ADUs and here we're illustrating the fact that um, on a small lot you can have a, uh, a little bit of extra floor area ratio or space to facilitate uh, turning a garage or an accessory structure into an ADU. Each tear sheet has um, a visual on the site standards. There are always photos on the left showing examples of that kind of an ADU, and they have floor plans as well. This one shows detached new construction. And um, the site standards are complicated in some cases with more than one height standard applying. So when you have a visual representation, people are able to see how the site standards relate to one another. Heights, as well as some of the other site regulations, depend on where the ADU is on the parcel. So we take some, um, some space to illustrate each of the circumstances so people can find their circumstance in the array of examples and go from there. All of the documents are photo rich. We um, try and illustrate design ideas so that um, it's just simpler and people can have a sense that this is kind of a doable process. Um, in this case, we're showing how one can use basement space or attic space to uh, carve out an ADU in an existing home. We also produced a cost and financing guide. ADUs have some financing challenges that are different from regular single family dwellings. We go into those, we lay out the financing options. We also spend um, quite a bit of effort on fully disclosing the fees. And um, we cover all the county department fees as well as special district fees in the hope that we can give people really the most full picture of um, what it takes to create an ADU and then of course help them, help them work through each of those steps. Here's an excerpt from the fee chart and um, the way we set this up is we focus on examples of different kinds of accessory dwelling units, and then we call out the basis for every fee. The um, idea here is we try and show people what aspects of the costs they can control with their design, and um, that way tr show people that there really is a range and there are ways that you can work with even things like the fees to minimize your costs. And this, of course, is after your board um, uh, made an effort to find the places where fees could be reduced and minimized overall, and we did bring that to your board with the regulations. Just showing you that we cover all the different um, county departments. Um, understanding how the fees are based really is a powerful way to reduce your cost. For example, the roadside and transportation fees only apply if your ADU requires a parking space, and you can design so that that parking space isn't necessary, and that way you can minimize um, one of the more sizable fees. We cover the special districts. This example are the fees for the fire protection districts. We also include the school districts and the water districts. The financing guide tells the story of the costs and the financing through using prototype examples. The prototypes we explain are the single family, well, I'm sorry, the detached accessory dwelling unit, the accessory dwelling unit over a garage, 
one that's not pictured is very popular as a conversion of an existing garage. And then lastly, this is a photo of um, space within an existing dwelling. If you have space for a mini kitchen and some other small changes, a master bedroom suite, a regular bedroom, or a den can be used as a space that can produce a very nice accessory dwelling unit. The guide goes over the fees and the costs for each of those prototypes and what we call the remodel alternative. And um, really the bottom line is that building a detached structure is the most expensive option and that it's very cost effective to do the remodel alternative. And we made changes to the code so that that remodel alternative is, um, is facilitated. You can do the latter, the remodel alternative, for under $30,000. This is a visual of a tool that's on the website. It's the ADU cost estimator, and it has a couple of pieces. One is um, a construction estimator. And what this does is it um, helps people see and plan for each of the categories of costs they can expect, the hard costs, the soft costs, and the fees. It returns a total a, a total expected cost, and then that is fed into another tool. These are based on Excel spreadsheets and they're accessed through the same web portal, um, where people can uh, uh, begin to see what their cash flow would be. This one allows people to, um, this is a static example, but you can put in different scenarios and it helps people explore what the costs of different kinds of financing would be and um, what different rents would return to them over time. And in this one example, this is for a household of one in a 640 square foot ADU over a garage. And you can see that it returns a positive cash flow monthly. And then of course, after 20 years or whatever the term of the loan is, that investment, the cash flow in increases substantially. Uh, one of the ways we hope this will be used is um, there are portions of the guidance that um, speak about the Housing Choice Voucher Program, also known as Section 8, and we compare <laughs> the, um, the value of a voucher against fair market value and, and the, the, the current uh, data we have on rents to show that there are circumstances where that's a really fairly positive comparison and that it might make economic sense to rent to somebody who holds one of those vouchers. Other aspects of the program include pointing people to um, outside of the county resources. We of course highlight the county program, the loan program, that um, um, people can um, potentially receive a forgivable loan of up to $40,000 in return for the unit being deed restricted for 20 years. Um, there are also um, outside organizations like Bay Federal, for example, which has a loan program or is developing one that's directed specifically to accessory dwelling units. So overall, there's a web presence, there are documents, we have new brochures, the new regulations are in place, and there's county staff trained up and um, available to really help guide people through the ADU process. And um, we report to the board annually on the number of ADUs that have been built that previous year with the growth goal. And um, we're looking forward to keeping track and seeing whether new ADUs really are encouraged and reporting that to the board. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Levine, for that wonderful presentation, and welcome back to this Noisy for the day. Is there anybody that would like to ask questions before we open it up for the community? Supervisor Leopold. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you for the presentation and for the hard work that went in uh, to creating these documents and this website. Um, an early version of this I shared with a neighbor, uh, you know, when it was in draft form to give some sense uh, uh, about what it would cost to build an ADU on my block, uh, and she found it very helpful. Um, and this before all these additional tools uh, were added. So as I look at this cost estimator and, and all the other pieces that you put some time into creating, it seems like it will do a great job in answering questions for people as they think about ADUs. Because I'm sure I'm not the only one up here who gets questions from constituents who are very interested in doing this. And sometimes they're prepared to know that it's gonna cost, could, could cost $100,000. And some are shocked 
to find out um, uh, how much it actually cost. And so uh, to be able to do this, uh, to have the estimator in terms of uh, uh, the, the rent, the mortgage, uh, a, a number of different factors, I think will give people a really good idea of what it is they're getting into at the front end. I also think this is a great m model for other things within the planning department because one of the other uh, uh, questions uh, we get is I uh, came to uh, do something uh, on my property and I didn't know I was going to have to pay this public works fee or this this school fee or something else and so being able to share with people the cost of uh, of fees on the front end is a really effective way to make sure that they're happy on the back end. Um, and I just appreciate all the work that went into this and uh, Ms. Noisy, uh, glad to have you back for this hearing. Uh, so, sorry to leave you, uh, to have you leave as a member of the county family. Glad you're still here in Santa Cruz. Yes, Supervisor uh, McPherson. Yeah, I, um, congratulations on a job very well done, I think. Um, have you, now that you have this model, uh, have you received anything back? That we'd like just a little more or something else? Uh, I know you went through that process once, or has this been a process in general, but is there anything that, that you see we need more of in this? Um, we do know that this whole system will have to be updated fairly frequently. There's a new batch of bills in Sacramento that um, we may be back here making further, further amendments to the site standards in the not too distant um, as a result of that. So there's definitely, there's still barriers and there's more work to be done and um, we will definitely be tracking that and changing things as needed. Yeah, I know there's ongoing and I think that the state saw in their, their legislation and this is probably the, the, the mo best, most immediate answer f to address our housing crisis that we have here and throughout the state. Uh, I think one thing that f folks want more of is um, assurance, okay, this is, I can be told what to do and go ahead and have confidence that um, that's all I need to do. Um, I think this is a step, a tremendous step in this direction. Mm -hmm. If somebody is, uh, it depends on how familiar they are with the website and so forth, but uh, how long would you think would take for them to get a, to make an application and say, yes, you can go ahead? I mean, is there, any kind of a timeline. We, we hear the stories from the past, uh, way past, that this has taken me three years and I still can't get it done. Um, is there any timeline, a, a general timeline that you think that people can go in and say, this is what I wanna do, I, I can get the straight answer and move ahead or decide not to do it? Uh, the key thing is that in almost every single case, it's a ministerial permit, meaning it's just a building permit. And when you hear about those stretched out time frames, it's usually because there's an associated discretionary permit, public hearing, uh, as, as part of what somebody's trying to accomplish. When it's a straight building permit, then that time frame is really quite shortened, just, you know, um, for that reason. Um, also, the stretched out timeframes tend to be um, properties that have complications and um, we, um, you know, we work quite a bit with environmental health and to give people um, some uh, upfront information about septic considerations, which is a big thing in the mountain areas that has um, been difficult. And your, um, your board made a change to the general plan as part of this in an earlier iteration that um, the one acre minimum no longer applies on, um, right. on, on, on certain sites and watersheds. So um, um, lots of things have become simpler and they're all ministerial permits. Uh, you know, except for certain particular circumstance in the coastal zone or on ag land. Yeah. Again, I want to congratulate you for uh, taking what the state uh, passed through legislation and implementing it here. It seems like it's the most straightforward way we can uh, we can use to address our housing crisis here in Santa Cruz County. Thank you very much. Well, I'll make some uh, brief comments. I mean, I do, I think that this is a significant, I don't think we can underscore enough how this is a significant step forward. ADUs are one of the fastest and least expensive ways to increase affordable housing in Santa Cruz County. And over the last year, we have slashed the fees, significantly streamlined the process so that it's much faster to get to construction and even created a forgivable loan program that in some instances could fully fund the construction and fees associated with a new ADU if you're willing to deed restrict it for affordable housing. Uh, I would expect that this really will incent a lot of new ADU construction within the county, which is, a, which is sorely needed and could help bring uh, 
a number of new affordable housing units uh, into the county in the next 12 to 24 months, and the, this is due directly to the work that you brought forward and the board prioritized, and I just appreciate the work uh, that the planning department's done on this. Uh, we'd like to open it up for the community. There's an opportunity for members of the community to address us on item 46, uh, the ADU program. Good morning. Good morning, thank you for your presentation. That was quite informative. I didn't know that the ADUs could also be a conversion like of a garage, uh, for instance. And then I have a few questions that came up as you were speaking. Um, in terms of, and your comments, Supervisor McPherson, I think the, the homeless problem and the inequities uh, of this capitalist society um, are, are so vast and the foundation is so, um, you know, unfair. It may help a, a little bit, um, but I think we need more structural changes. Is this um, to... Uh, receive a building permit for the ADU, here's one question. It Does this have to be like for Section 8 voucher HUD housing for affordable, however that's defined, housing? That's one question. My second question is, when I hear about streamlining a process, uh, what I've been learning over the years is often um, environmental um, requirements to protect the environment uh, seem to be waived. So how does th this uh, new ADU policy um, uh, coincide or does it say CEQA is a negative declaration, California Environmental Quality Act. So those are my two questions that appreciate an answer. Thank you for your presentation again. Thank you. Is there anybody else from the community that would like to address us on this item? Okay, well, seeing none, uh, Supervisor Coonerty? Yeah, I just want to take a moment and <clears throat> thank you. This is really, really good work. Um, it's accessible, it's simplified, it's exactly, I think, what people need to just, uh, demystify a process that is a real big opportunity to allow people to age in place, to allow um, uh, more affordable units be built. Uh, it's, a, it's a tremendous opportunity. And I just wanna, this is far exceeds any expectation uh, that I had, uh, that I had high expectations, but <laughs> you exceeded them. Um, and so I wanna thank you for this work. And I think it's just really important that my colleagues and I all include this in our newsletters to start spreading the word that we use social media, um, we can, you know, um, focus on homeowners who may be the perfect market for this uh, in the unincorporated areas. So I think there's a lot of opportunities to reach people where they are and make sure we give them this information um, just when, they, when they're beginning to think through uh, this opportunity. So uh, if there's no other further comments or questions, I'll move the recommended action. Second. Well, just one Before question. There, just we do have a motion from Supervisor Coonerty, a second from Supervisor Leopold, Supervisor Caput. When they, when they do the... Uh, uh, the additional uh, unit to the property, the reassessment of the property tax would be based on the cost of the uh, uh, construction? Yeah, there is a section that covers that in, in, the, um, in the document and there is a, th there's not an overall reassessment of the property. So any benefit a homeowner has from having had the property for a long time, for example, under Proposition 13 rules, sure. no, re no large scale reassessment is triggered. The assessor will um, increase the value of the property incrementally to recognize the value of the ADU. The way they do that sounds like is somewhat art and somewhat science. Um, I, I don't know this, the, the, the details of that, but um, um, there is an incremental but um, very much limited um, change to the property tax as a result. It's the same as if you would have remodeled your house and increased its value in the traditional way. Thank you. And just to briefly answer the two questions that were asked, on, on the, in the environmental, this does uh, nothing to reduce the environmental review. This creates site standards and in essence, um, 
we went through a pretty extensive process to say when, where, and how these could be built. And this allows you, if you meet those guidelines, to come in and just get an over-the-counter permit. I mean, I'm, I'm simplifying an extensive discussion, but this was an extensive discussion of where these can and can't be done. And no, you don't have to be Section 8, but uh, we, we, do have afford we do have forgivable loans for those that are willing to uh, build deed-restricted affordable housing. As you know, that's to, uh, based on the area median income and a percentage of that. Uh, we did make restrictions on these being short, they, they can't be short-term rentals, for example, so they can't be an Airbnb. They're designed for long-term uh, rentals for people to be able to uh, age in place. For example, people in my district have said, parents have said they, they want to move into an ADU and let their kids be able to take over the front unit. They wouldn't otherwise be able to, to do that. There's local teachers uh, that don't have a place to start off. This uh, allows that. They're affordable even by design because by definition they're not as large as a home, and so they, although they afford a lot of the amenities of a home, uh, they're much cheaper than the average rent would be for other things. So um, I hope that addresses your questions. We do have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you, Sarah. Don't bill us back for that time. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, move, we'll move on to item 47, which is to consider a report and presentation on homeless outreach, proactive engagement and services, or the HOPE's implementation plan and performance measures, and direct the Health Services Agency to return during budget hearings in June 2018 with an update as outlined in the memo of the Director of Health Services. We have an agenda uh, board memo, and Ms. Ferreira, welcome. Good morning. This morning I wanted to do a quick review on the background of the development of the HOPES team, walk through some of the goals that were established for the HOPES program, as well as the model that's currently been developed um, as a refinement of the prior PACT team model. Um, and then review a set of HOPES performance measures with the board, and then we have two recommendations for your consideration this morning. In terms of some background, the Bob Lee Partnership for Accountability, Connection, and Treatment, the PACT program, um, was the prior iteration of HOPES, and the board directed our health services agency to work with the PACT Executive Committee and the City of Santa Cruz to redesign the PACT program in response to an evaluation that was done by CSUMB. The board approved that PACT redesign and approved the HOPES team model on December 12, 2017. The Santa Cruz City Council, in turn, was presented this same model and offered its approval on January 9th of 2018. The Health Services Agency was directed by the board to present a set of performance measures or outcomes this spring of 2018 and a program update which we plan to do during our budget hearings in June. HOPES goals, what do we do with the HOPES program? Um, our primary role is really to offer some stability for our community's most vulnerable citizens um, who are homeless, they often have a mental illness and or substance use disorder, frequent contact with law enforcement, the public or local community businesses, and are often having difficulty engaging in services. The HOPES team is a multidisciplinary team made up of the health services agency programs such as the Homeless Persons Health Project, our mobile emergency response team, our community mental health programs and adult services, um, services from the Human Services Department and our Homeless Policy Steering Committee. The HOPES team uses an early and open referral process, and I'll talk about that a little bit in a few slides, an intensive monitoring and engagement model, and we offer triage and coordinated access to existing programs and services in the community. This program's funded jointly by the city and the county. The HOPES model is a county-wide model, but we have a special emphasis on areas most impacted in the county, particularly the city of Santa Cruz and the downtown area. As I mentioned before, it's a collaborative model. Um, we have participation and input from our Homeless Policy Steering Committee within the county 
our Human Services Department, and our Health Services Agency. And then we have a set of core members who actually participate several times a week in a multidisciplinary team meeting from the HPHP program, County Behavioral Health, our downtown outreach workers, our mobile emergency response team, our veterans advocate, and our behavioral health court liaison. There are a number of underlying principles which went into developing this new model. The first being that we're seeking to integrate care, ensure a coordinated response for services based on what the client's needs are at that time. We are looking to implement a responsive and supportive approach to the community as an equal partner in the program. And we've utilized existing funding to operate primarily weekdays, eight to five, and we have some extended coverage on weekends and evenings. And the program utilizes a no wrong door model to care. So our goal is to support all individuals and connect them to the services that they need at that time. Our current refer referral process is that multidisciplinary team members, the partners that I mentioned before, can bring in referrals to the team during those case conferences that take place several times a week. We began with an email referral system, which I've listed on this slide, and have since moved to a secure web portal, which we went live with this week. And any individual or agency or stakeholder in the community that makes a referral to the HOPES team receives information back as well in terms of how they can contact our HOPES team project manager for additional information or to provide um, additional feedback on the, on the work of the team. And we do do quite a bit of work with local law enforcement, um, jail staff and community partners such as local businesses and our local hospitals to also solicit referrals for the team. In terms of next steps to enhance the referral process, we are recruiting for a public health nurse to establish um, a direct referral line and also provide uh, enhanced medical triage for referrals coming into the team. And I did want to take a moment to recognize Jasmine Nahetta. Jasmine's in the audience here today. And Jasmine's our, our program director for the team and has been leading this program since it began on March 12th this year. And I, the board has seen these slides and I thought I'd take a moment just to walk through our, our referral and assessment model that the team utilizes. Again, when referrals come into the HOPES team, we start with an initial, initial triage by a HOPES team member to determine what type of response level do we need for this particular referral. Is this an immediate crisis response or can we refer it for a later response by the team depending on what the immediate needs are being presented. Step two is working on an assessment, outreach, and engagement plan for that particular referral. We utilize a stages of change model. Um, this is a point where we would be introducing a harm reduction approach to working with the individual in the community. We're assessing treatment readiness and we're working to engage them to support that individual um, connecting with services. And we have a number of different tracks that we work to engage the individual into depending on their level of court or legal involvement and the severity of their mental illness. And those are listed in step three. And in terms of, I did want to mention the um, Bob Lee Pact program continues to exist as a specialty court at this, at this point. So you'll see that in the second box um, for individuals who have a mild to moderate mental health condition, a mild to severe substance use disorder, generally a misdemeanor crime that's pending, they could be referred to the Bob Lee Pact Court. And we'll talk about some specific outcomes related to the Pact Court later. In terms of our proposed performance measures, We've, perform, we've proposed a series of measures across five different system domains. 
Um, first are a set of system measures, health measures, community, criminal justice, and individual level measures. And these five different domains will be informing five different outcome areas which will be developed in the near future. Housing status and stability, public service use and cost, substance use, mental health, and quality of life. In phase one, we're proposing to develop a set of baseline data through December 2018. Our big challenge in, in working with these different data sets is that the data on the clients that we're working with in HOPES is located in multiple sources, and it's difficult to link these different databases to come up with specific outcome measures for this population. We have developed a client registry that we're able to run individualized reports off of the databases that we have current access to. And that client registry also locates, also notes the location of the client so that we can generate reports based on where the referral is coming from. And again, in phase one, we're looking to establish some baseline data which will help inform the outcomes development in phase two which we're projecting to start in January of 2019. Part of what we plan to use to support the development of outcomes measures is a new platform within the Santa Cruz Health Information Exchange called CrossTX. This product's being supported through our Whole Person Care Initiative, and that will create a, an individualized patient dashboard which will have measures and information from multiple different data sources to provide the treatment team a more holistic view of what's happening with that particular referral. The performance measures that we're proposing for phase one total 23, and you can see a breakdown of the numbers of measures in both phase one and phase two by the five different domain areas to give us a total of 33 by the end of phase two, which is quite a significant number of measures. Um, and here's a summary chart. The items that are highlighted in yellow are those for phase one and the ones highlighted in gray are for phase two. And we're anticipating that those gray items um, will be worked into our overall set of measures, um, although they present some challenges in terms of, of accessing that information for our team right now. We have two recommendations for your board's consideration. Um, first is that you approve the HOPES implementation plan and performance measures, and that the second that you direct us to return back to the board and during the budget hearings to um, provide an update on the program as well as the projected cost for developing an evaluation and outcomes um, data model, and that we need some outside consultation on. Are there any questions? Thank you. Are there any questions or comments from board members on this item? Supervisor Coonerty? Sure. Uh, yeah, just some uh, comments. First, I appreciate the work. Um, I will say that Jasmine's already getting uh, rave reviews from uh, folks I know downtown uh, who have appreciated her outreach and her follow-up, and so having her on the team is, is, is essential to success. I think one of the things I really want to focus on is that the PAC program always started as a community-driven uh, program to reduce community impacts. Uh, these are often the most challenging folks and people, people uh, and a lot of programs always pointed a different direction for who, who had responsibility for dealing with this uh, particular population. And so the fact that we have a program here who, who, is, who starts with the community impacts, helps people in whatever way they can, um, and then res is responsive to the community is, is to me the essential element of, of this HOPES uh, program. And I want to make sure that that's the focus. We have a lot of outcomes, uh, and I'm, I'm always in favor of tr tracking outcomes. Uh, the, as I've made clear to your team, I don't want the team to spend their whole time tracking outcomes instead of doing outreach. Uh, and I also don't want to create a system where people, uh, where there's incentives to maybe not take the hardest people because they're going to be the hardest people to get good outcomes for. But where we hear from the community about 
what's the biggest concern, and this team is proactive and responsive in, in trying to address that concern using every method possible. And so uh, I think this is an exciting step forward, and I appreciate uh, the, the city-county collaboration on this program. Thank you, and I would also like to thank the board for its support and direction in terms of supporting the health services agency and improving the program moving forward. Supervisor uh, Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you for the presentation and the ongoing work on, on reimagining this program. Uh, I think um, it's, a, it's a good sign that we evaluated, took a look at, reconfigured and have come up with something that still that meets the needs of the uh, and the goals of the original program in a way that is uh, th that I think will work uh, even better than it did before. I particularly like uh, these 33 different outcome measures um, and there are some things that uh, we wouldn't have thought of three or four years ago um, to include in there like vaccinations but after going through the hepatitis A epidemic just uh, last year, and understanding the role of public health and, and uh, the, um, uh, the, the strain that it puts on the public health system and the risk that, um, that uh, people who are homeless uh, face uh, in contracting disease. I think it, it really makes sense as I look over these, uh, these 33 measures. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, though, about the reporting system. Um, uh, it is both a great opportunity that people will be able to uh, report in through this portal, and I'm, I'm a little concerned about what the expectation is. So uh, if, if I or a downtown merchant or somebody in Live Oak uh, re reports in through the portal that there is someone that in need of assistance, um, what kind of information should they expect that they'll actually get back from uh, the staff? Well, there's limited specific information that we could share in that example with a downtown merchant, but part of our approach is to work both with the individual being referred and the merchant as equal partners, as, as mentioned earlier, so that our staff will be engaging both. Um, and connecting back to the merchant and letting them know in general terms what they can expect for a response from the county, um, trying to address any ongoing concerns that they may have about the particular referral of the situation. And we're certainly there to listen and be as responsive as we can without violating an individual's right to privacy. Right. Um, but if a particular merchant says, you know, hey, Jasmine, I keep seeing this person. I know I can see you talking to them every day, but they come back three hours later and they're continuing to cause problems for me. We can help problem solve that particular situation with the merchant without getting into the, into the areas of, of violating a person's privacy. So we're seeking to use, use both approaches in terms of each of these referrals. Yeah, well, I think uh, we're, uh, we're asking a lot of Jasmine and, and others uh, because uh, if someone's creating a problem or the perceived problem um, uh, and we can't share information about what we're actually doing with the person and that person keeps on showing up, it's to, to be able to work on both sides of that equation is, is going to be very challenging. So It is. Um, it is. I, uh, I, I wish you uh, good luck. Thank you. Uh, in uh, being able to take care of that, and we should all be uh, realistic about what we, uh, what we would uh, expect to see with something like that. Um, you've been doing this since the beginning of uh, March or middle of March. Now we're in the middle of May. Is it working? Um, have there been any successes that you could point to? Um, it, it really is working, and um, there have been a number of success stories, particularly for um, some challenging individuals, um, and Jasmine and I have the opportunity to review these, these stories from time to time, and I think it's, the team also has an opportunity to review and celebrate success stories as well, because we often hear about problem cases, but we don't often hear about the successes that we have in the community either through the work that, that this team does. Um, and there are a couple that come to mind. Um, 
one that she and I were talking about was an elderly homeless man who had been at the jail and was scheduled to be discharged back to homelessness. And he happened to be in a wheelchair. Um, and we had the opportunity to meet with him prior to being discharged from the jail to see what kind of plan we could put into place for him. And he was someone that was very well known in the community and had, had frequent contacts with a number of people. Um, struggled with issues around sobriety. Um, so they were able to, at the time of discharge, secure a, a temporary spot for him at the River Street Camp for one night until we could move him into a shelter bed. And that shelter bed was able to provide him some stability until we could work on a longer term plan. He had not been connected to medical services and we were able to connect him to medical care through our Homeless Persons Health Project. Um, and he had also lost his social security disability benefits, which are a key to um, him having access to resources in the community. And we were able to work with him to get his SSI benefits reinstated. Um, we work with him on a daily basis. Um, we're also connecting him with um, VA services. Um, and he's doing quite well right now. Um, and he's someone that I would definitely consider to be a success story that had been a failure in the community prior to the HOPES, HOPES model. Um, another one that, that I mentioned because it was particularly striking um, was an individual that was frequently visiting the emergency department at Dominican Hospital. And they have a group called the High Utilizer Group that meets quite frequently around these cases. Um, and made a referral of this individual to the HOPES team. And nothing had worked in the past, and that's the types of folks that the HUGS team is reviewing. Um, so they referred him to HOPES um, as a kind of a last-ditched model, I guess, of, of trying to get him the help that he needed. Um, and he often visited the emergency department for issues around alcohol abuse. Um, the HOPES team engaged him and they were actually able to get him into treatment at Janus. Um, and he is also connected with a sober living environment while he's awaiting permanent housing. So he's another highly successful story that um, really is striking because it's someone that we had not had success for in the past prior to implementing HOPES. So there are countless stories that I've heard about from Jasmine and the team about successes, but those are two that come to mind that I thought I'd mention today. <coughs> well, it sounds like a good hugs to hope uh, handoff. Yeah. Um, and I think that, that it, when we look at these uh, measures, we'll start seeing some of that data then come out, right? People using the emergency room less, people getting into treatment, people getting into housing. Um, that, that will help tell the story about whether this uh, model is working. And so I look forward to seeing uh, that information. Appreciate the ongoing work. And yeah. uh, I, 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 I um, this is, an, uh, this is uh, an issue in which gets a lot of a discussion out in the community and trying to come up with new ways to, uh, to address a pressing social problem uh, is really critical. So I appreciate the work of you and your team. Thank you, Jasmine, Thank you. for your work too. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I, I do think, um, I do appreciate your work in um, putting this HOPES uh, pro uh, process together. Um, I think this is the most intense and explosive program we have in our community and throughout the communities uh, around us. Um, one, one significant thing was um, we just received our budget, uh, proposed budget, uh, a couple days ago and um, this, to implement this I'm sure is gonna cost uh, some, some funds. I don't know that, we really don't know exactly the program impl full implementation and I know that uh, from experience that uh, 
state and federal funding for this is, uh, shall we say, uh, it's fluctuating all the time. Mm -hmm. Do we have, do we have anything earmarked for this of what it might cost or anything <coughs> in the budget, in the proposed budget? Um, I don't, at this time, uh, you know, we, we, we don't know what the cost is gonna be, I can understand that, but do we have anything in there that's proposed in the proposed budget? For the overall HOPES program? Um, but, yeah. Um, yeah, we, we have um, level funding set aside for next year to maintain the program through the year. What we don't have currently is an estimate on the cost for a consultant to help us develop the the specific outcomes, measures, and evaluation tool. Okay. Well, I think this is um, a problem that um, it's going to be community, a community resolution to it. It's going to take a lot of work by a lot of people. And the privacy aspect, you did um, mention that too. Is that, does that create, how big of a problem does that create? I mean, is it 30% uh, of the people that that uh, you go to assist, they say, I don't want any of your help, or is there any percentage of people that say, just get out of my life? I think with this particular group, um, a lot of them have challenges around engaging in treatment. And we have different models that we can use to continue working with the person to get them to that point. Um, but one of the big challenges for us is is being able to tell that story. Um, so we can't share what we're doing or why, you know, we're not seeing particular results with the client that we're working with on HOPES um, because they have a right to privacy around that information. Um, so it makes it difficult for us to share on a specific basis. Well, why am I, why do I keep seeing this person in this area and you're not helping them. And we may be doing lots of things with them, um, but we can't share that specific information. So it becomes a challenge for us to share both our successes, but also the barriers that we run into because everyone has a right to refuse treatment. And we can work with an individual to you know, continue engaging them and hopefully get them to the point at some point where they're ready and able to engage in services, um, but we can't compel that. And that's a right that every citizen of our state has, and it often presents big challenges for us. Now, well, this is one where the government uh, is at the end of the of the situation it, and has to come up with a solution. Um, and it's a big, big challenge for us. I hope the, the community in general realizes that. Uh, and I appreciate your putting together this package and the, the 33 um, issues that you had said that we we're going to address and include in this. I think it's very important. So there's some fluctuation and these are individuals we're working with and they all have different uh, problems that uh, need to be addressed. But thank you and Jasmine and uh, the whole team for putting this together. It's very much thank needed you. at this time. Thank you. Supervisor Caput. Yeah, I, uh, I want to thank you also. Uh, I think this is a great idea. and I want to congratulate you and your staff for actually looking at something and coming up with a, um, something that's going to help alleviate a problem. And uh, you mentioned something interesting about Social Security. Uh, that maybe they weren't able to get the check to the individual you were talking about. I, I Maybe this is a Social Security uh, question, but uh, do they mail it to some address and then it comes back to them and then they cancel it? And when they reinstate it, do they give the money that was returned to them all in one lump sum? It's a, it's a complicated question. You know, some people lose their benefits because they didn't go through a rede redetermination process. Some people don't have a bank account. Some people may have had a payee established where they have to pick up their check from somebody else. Um, so it's, it's, there are lots of people that might be entitled to benefits that aren't receiving them for a number of different reasons. Right. And we work with our human services department and our other partners in the community to make sure that if somebody is entitled to those benefits that they get access to them. And if they're owed past, past payments, they do get those retroactively generally. 
Do you, do you overlap a little bit with uh, veterans services? Uh, Cause we do have a outreach uh, veterans uh, uh, outreach worker that goes out there too. So you kind of work together. Uh. Yes, the um, veterans advocate is part of our HOPES team, multidisciplinary Good. team, yes. Good to hear. And then they would get separate treatment. They would probably be referred to either Palo Alto or uh, now the new uh, uh, hospital, basically, in uh, Monterey. If, if they're eligible for those services, we do have veterans that aren't, um, that don't have a service-connected disability, for example, so they may not be able to access medical services that's through the true. VA, but that's part of the role of the advocate is to determine what they're eligible for and not. Congratulations on all of, the, all of you for all, you know looking at this and coming up with something. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is, uh, we'll now open it up to the community. This is an opportunity for members of the community to address us specifically on this item. Good morning. Thank you for waiting. Hi. My name is Nina. I uh, reside in the Live Oak area, um, but I utilize lots of things downtown frequently, uh, the shopping, the entertainment. So I uh, see what this gentleman is talking about. I can see that he does offer assistance for the population that I often see living rough about. Uh, my one question or comment would be on a statement he made that the most impacted area was the downtown area and I wondered if that was maybe just the most visible. Um, I do a lot of volunteer work in the environment and specifically the waterways. Uh, Watsonville, uh, recently I did the snapshot uh, water exploration science, uh, citizen science, and I find there are uh, a lot of people living rough in encampments all over in our waterways, um, not just around a gulch. My work this week was with the Lower Carbonara and um, Brands of 40. So anyway, uh, just to the board, uh, not to say anything against what he's doing, but we need to keep that in mind too. It's lovely to see them moving away from the downtown area. I feel much more comfortable. I ride my bike a lot. I'm 67, so I'm older and a little intimidated by groups of men sometimes. But I'm seeing uh, they've a lot of them have moved into our waterway areas. So just uh, don't lose sight of that. That's it. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you for those comments. Is there anybody else I'd like to address this on this item? I definitely appreciate your, your intentions and desire to help <clears throat> the homeless. Um, <clears throat> um, I see this so much as uh, band-aids on a gushing wound. <laughs> because of the inequities of the society. Like, why do we have homeless and unemployment in what is this, one of the wealthiest nations in the world? There's something the matter here. And try as you may, this is such a small area of assistance for what is actually needed. You spoke about um, meeting the needs of people, Supervisor Leopold. If we really met the needs of people, and I'm not blaming you, people would have employment, housing, food, a healthy environment, and we're trying to mitigate what we don't have. What I see is the profit system and what the corporations are doing. Um, I, I have a question here also about, and, and I always think of how the military gets about 50% of the income that, you know, we're paying taxes that I would like to see go into this county for services that we actually need, schools and social services and housing and et cetera, and it's being siphoned out to you know, kill people in other countries, that's not right. When you talk about treatment so often, what does that mean? Uh, does that mean pharmaceuticals? I've read a lot about pharmaceutical, the downside of this um, 
you know, pharmaceutical industry and the harm to people. What does it mean? Treatment is different in different cases. Thank you for the few examples you gave of the outreach. I think this is really important what you're actually doing, and I uh, have the same sense you do, Supervisor Coonerty, about you know your marking performance and data. But is there too much of that and too much complication, and we need much more assistance, meaningful help to people? Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else would like to address this on this item? Uh, seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board. Su Supervisor Caput. Thank you. Uh, actually, uh, Marilyn, you brought up a good point. Uh, I guess some of your referral, when somebody goes out there, uh, when the new mental health facility opens up in uh, Watsonville, uh, would they be referred to like a psychiatrist counselor for ongoing uh, conversation that they can have with somebody, a professional? Yes, absolutely, and I had mentioned there were the four tracks um, in terms of referral pathways. Um, two of them are through specialty courts that we have, and then we have a third track for our integrated behavioral health program, which is embedded in our clinics, both in North County and South County, and then our specialty mental health services in North County and South County. So. It really depends on the individual's needs, the severity of their mental illness, what type of substance use disorder issues they may have um, in terms of, of <coughs> what services we're connecting them to. But yeah, the, the new Watsonville Behavioral Health Office building and its expanded staffing will definitely offer some additional resources for South County. Supervisor Leopold. Um, just one last quick, quick, quick question. Are you making a presentation about this to the Santa Cruz City Council? I have offered to make the same presentation to the City Council. Um, I haven't gotten a date yet. They were thinking sometime perhaps in August for a presentation, but I have made that offer to them as well. Yeah, I would encourage that and encourage our County Administrative Officer and in conversations with uh, the City Manager there. I think sharing this information is, a, is a very important. I, I am ready to move the recommended actions. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor Leopold, a second from Supervisor Coonerty. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. If, if you could just stick around, because I, I, there's an item that I want to call back up yes. that, that you might need to address. Yes. So item 48 is to consider the final appointment of Bryce Root to the Workforce Development Board as a representative of local business for a term to expire June 30th of 2020. We have the final appointment memo in the Workforce Development Board application. Are there any questions from board members? Is there anybody from the community that would like to address this on this item? Seeing none, Supervisor Leopold. Approval. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor Leopold, a second from uh, Supervisor Caput. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. And I know that there was an item on consent that Supervisor Leopold wanted to make a minor direction on. Supervisor Leopold, which yeah, item was chair, that? Yeah, Chair, I, I look to uh, County Council. I, I, on item 20, there, which was an item about uh, uh, approving amendment to the telecare contract uh, uh, for provision of augmented uh, crisis stabilization program for minors. Um, I wanted to add an additional direction about getting a report back about the physical facility next to our behavioral health uh, center um, because I understood that that to be something that was also going to help young people and we haven't heard a status report and I was wondering if we could get a report back at our June 12th meeting. Okay. I, I, I guess the question is do I need to um, we have a motion, a motion for reconsider, reconsider item 20? Second. Or, that I would move for reconsideration. To reconsider the consent agenda, and then the you would ask for this. Okay. Okay. So I reconsider the consent agenda, uh, and, and seconded by uh, Supervisor uh, Coonerty. Um, are there any other comments on this? All those in favor of the reconsideration of the consent agenda, say aye. 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 Opposed. It passes unanimously. Then I, I would ask for a report back on uh, the construction schedule. Uh, for the facility uh, 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 directly next to our behavioral health center uh, back before our board on, at our June 12th meeting. I think that's our meeting date. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is, 
we'd like to open it up now for the community. There's an opportunity for members of the community to address us. We have an item here on consent, item 20, that now received additional direction. Would anybody else like to comment on that item? Uh, bring it back to the board. We now need a motion for consent with the, as amended. I would uh, move the consent agenda as amended. Thank you. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor Leopold, a second from Supervisor Coonerty with additional direction on item 20. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. We have no closed session today, so this does complete this meeting. We'd like to thank the Sentinel and Community TV uh, for covering today's meeting, and we'll see you here in a couple weeks.